So I'd like to first <coughs> introduce Phyllis, who is a fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies, where she's an analyst, uh, activist, writer on the Middle East and UN issues. She is really a, a global peace worker, you could say. She works with many anti-war organizations, writes and speaks widely uh, across the U.S. and around the world. We are living through an era of permanent war in this country. That doesn't mean just since the Trump administration. This has a long, long, sad pedigree. We have been in this version of war, and there are many iterations of wars. At the end of the day, they all have to do with resources, with power, with the expansion of military bases, with all of those things. But they take different forms at different times. The current iteration of what we know as the global war on terror, we've now been at war with terror for 16 years. And terror is doing just fine <laughs> at war. Doesn't seem to stop it. Why? Because something that President Obama used to say over and over again, although he never lived up to it, was really true, which is there is no military solution. Pretty simple. The problem was the actions said the opposite. The actions said there is only a military solution. And oh yeah, we should also on the side, we should do some diplomacy and yeah, we should do something about the conditions that make people want to support these extremist organizations. But really it's going to be about sending troops, sending drones, sending bombs, sending airstrikes. But there is no military solution. So this is what we have been looking at now for 16 years. If we look back just a little further, we are looking at other anniversaries. We're looking at the 26th anniversary of the first war against Iraq. We're looking at the 13th anniversary of the second US war against Iraq. We're looking at, in Afghanistan, the longest war in US history. The war in Syria, which the US, for a change, did not directly spark, but has been a major player in making sure that it continues much further than it would have is now longer than World War II. So the notion of what constitutes wars has changed dramatically so that we no longer can say, this was that war. The wars have all morphed into one big global war in which our government is the major problem. Our government is the major problem. What Dr. King taught us in 1967 at his extraordinary speech in Riverside, the Beyond Vietnam speech, by far the most ex important speech of Dr. King's life, not the, uh, the I Have a Dream speech. That was a great speech. But the really important one was four years later at Riverside Church when he spoke about Vietnam. And when he said, our government is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. He was right then. If he were alive today and repeated it, he would be right again today. The current iteration of Trump's foreign policy, such as it is, it's really hard to talk about that as anything other than a war policy. It's a war policy. And the notion of America first as the basis of foreign policy really means the military first. That's what this is all about. There was a moment during that horrific campaign when a few people were saying, you know, as horrifying as it's going to be if he ever God forbid one, in the rest of the world, maybe it would be a little better because maybe this notion of isolationism would mean pulling back some troops. Boy, were we wrong. Because it turns out that the isolationist part had nothing to do with the military. The isolationism was only about things like diplomacy and financial support and humanitarianism. Those things are now off the table because, you know, America first. The one that hasn't changed is the military part. So it's really about the military first. And what it looks like is aggressive, escalating military intervention in an ever-widening set of countries. An ever-widening set of countries. There's an extraordinary uh, bit written by a, a, a very brilliant US diplomat, a sentence that doesn't often come from me. Most US 
diplomats are not brilliant, but this former diplomat, Chaz Freeman, who some of you may be familiar with, is absolutely brilliant. He was both the ambassador at one point to Saudi Arabia, at another point he was ambassador to China, speaks both fluent Mandarin and fluent Arabic, and can translate between them, which I find astonishingly brilliant. But here's something he wrote about a year and a half ago, a couple of years ago almost, that gives us just a sense of where we are. The United States has now been engaged in a cold war with Iran for 37 years. It has conducted various levels of hot war in Iraq for 26 years. It has been in combat in Afghanistan for 15 years. Americans have bombed Somalia for 15, Libya for five, and Syria for one and a half years. One war has led to another, none has yielded any positive result, and none shows any signs of doing so. U.S. drones have been killing Yemenis for 14 years, Pakistanis for 12, and Somalis for nine. Saudi Arabia's bloody effort to reinstall an ousted government in Yemen is almost a year old. In none of these wars is an end in sight. A very quick survey of where we are in the world. And these strikes, these wars, are thoroughly illegal. Somehow that gets forgotten a lot of times. Right now, the forgettingness, I don't know if that's a word, but I'm going to make it up and call it a word, and we're sticking to it. The forgettingness of these wars has taken such a dramatic form that no one, like in Congress, even mentions the question of, is this somehow legally justified somewhere along the line? The heroic Barbara Lee is trying once again to get the authorization for the use of military support repealed. She has been unable to again. but. What's astonishing is that most of the time, the issue doesn't even come up. It doesn't even come up. Is this authorized by anything? The US is now going to war in Syria. Really? Who said we could? Who said we could? Well, there's a crisis. And for some people, no human rights violation exists that does not require a military solution. For other people, hey, there's some big human rights violations going on. That gives us a good excuse. Let's go. We've always wanted to. People want to go to war for a lot of different reasons. But somehow the issue of legality never enters that equation. You know, the UN Charter, which is one of my favorite documents, is very vague about a lot of things. It uses highfalutin language that you look at it and say, really? What the hell? What are you saying here? But there's a couple things in the UN Charter that are very, very clear. One of which is Article 51, which is the question of when is war legal? And the answer is almost never, <coughs> almost never. There's two very, very narrowly defined moments when a war of one country against another might be legal. One is if there has been an immediate strike that requires immediate self-defense. And then only until the Security Council can meet to decide what to do. The other is if the Security Council has authorized it. Well, we know none of those have happened for a very long time if we're talking about the United States. And yet no one holds the US accountable. Why? Because when you're the biggest and strongest military power in the world by infinite numbers of levels, who's really going to stand there and say, you know what? You don't have the right to do that. Oh, really, is the answer. Says who? Says the bully. So this is what we are facing. We have US laws, the War Powers Act is only one of them, that are being violated with impunity. And it's not even that Congress sort of, whether they're controlled by Democrats or Republicans, doesn't seem to have any influence, any ma doesn't matter at all. Are they prepared to even ask the question of under what authority are we doing this? No, it's just not, it's just not even asked. We have now the, a, an announcement by a president operating off of Twitter saying, oh yeah, I think I'm going to stop this CIA funding of opposition forces in Syria. And a few of us were saying, yay. Not because he got it right, because he doesn't get anything right, but because the impact of that is slightly less arms in an overarmed country. That's a good thing. I did an interview on this the other day with some sort of mainstream whatever, and they decided to use it as a Q&A, and the, the intro to it said, the CIA is stopping its support for opposition forces 
and you'll be surprised at who is, thinks that's a good idea or something like that. It was like, why is that surprising? That somebody who supports peace would think it's a good thing when we start stop arming everybody and their brother. Why is that so surprising? But nonetheless, apparently it's surprising. We are facing escalating wars everywhere we turn. The drone wars are continuing, but they are now not only drones, but airstrikes with planes and attack helicopters. We're not only providing basic tanks and uniforms to opposition forces, but we're now providing drones and helicopters and attack bombs all over the world. We're seeing threats, new threats against Iran. The US on the one hand says, well, we can't really deny it. Iran is abiding by the, its requirements under the Iran nuclear deal. And yet, we want new sanctions against Iran because they are playing a really bad role. Really, what are they doing in the region that's such a bad role? Without interfering with other countries. Really. <laughs> you want to say that again with a straight face? I mean, this, but this is what they're saying, right? This is the basis of it, that they are not helping in the region. Oh, right, and you are, I suppose. You know, the notion, well, they're in Iraq. Yeah, well, they share a border with Iraq. They have a little more right to be there. They don't really have a right to be there either, let's be clear. But they have a little more legitimacy than you do from 7,000 miles away, right? So this is what we are facing. The legacy of foreign policy in this country is in the main a very sad one. When we look at the vast chasm between the rhetoric of standing for freedom and democracy and humanitarianism around the world and what we actually do, which is to send guns and to send bombs and to send bombers and to send trainers of people there so they can drop their own bombs, that's the legacy. If we look at the legacy of the last president, if we look at President Obama's legacy, what we see is that his extraordinary successes in the Paris, Peace, the, the, the Paris uh, climate talks, in moving towards normalization with Cuba, and most especially in the Iran nuclear deal, were all examples of diplomacy triumphing over war. But when we look at all the rest of Obama's legacy, we see failure. And in every one of those failures, he failed in Syria, he failed in Iraq, he failed in Somalia, he failed in Yemen, he really failed in Libya. He has failed, failed, failed in every one of those countries. And it's because in all of those cases, war triumphed over diplomacy. And diplomacy was not allowed to be used. And we can argue till hell freezes over about exactly what the dynamics were in Washington between the White House and the Pentagon and the Pentagon and Congress and Congress and this one. At the end of the day, for the people under those policies, none of that matters. In the era of President Obama, more countries were bombed than were bombed under President Bush. Now, President Bush did plenty of things that Obama didn't do. He sent 150,000 troops at a time to occupy Iraq. Obama didn't do that. That's a good thing. But Obama used more drones, killed a lot of people. So our Failures, our failures with the GWAT, one of my favorite acronyms, because it sounds like what it is, it sounds evil, the global war on terror. The failures are based on a failure to recognize that there is no military solution against terrorism. Not against Al Qaeda, not against ISIS. Every one of them creates more terrorism that are worse. You know, the US, not surprisingly, is now allied with Al Qaeda. They won't kind of admit that, but they are. Why? Because ISIS is now worse than Al Qaeda. So I'm waiting for, OK, who's the next one that's going to make us ally with ISIS? Because the next guys are going to be even worse. Right? This is what we are dealing with. There are no military solutions. And then we hear, well, no one wants war. This, you know, every, nobody wants war. That's a lie. That's a lie. Most people don't want war. Most people in this country don't want war. They don't want their daughters and sons to be sent off to fight wars. They don't want us to be hated around the world. They don't want us to be threatened by people who are so angry about our wars. Most people don't want wars for good and bad reasons. The problem is there are a few people who do want wars. And they are very powerful. They are the ones who make a profit off of wars. 
Wars don't just happen. People profit from wars. So those Washington Post ads that we see around late August, early September every year, big full page ads, we see them in the metro. How many of you have been to protests in DC? Okay, so you've been on the metro around the Capitol, around the Smithsonian, all the ones on the mall, and you see these giant ads. They're like, you know, this big, they're huge. And they have like these weird, sort of beautiful, sort of weird, sort of scary graphics. It'll be like a plane taking off into a blue sky. And it's like, okay. And below it'll say the slogan will be something like, we stand with them. Yeah. So, okay, what's that supposed to mean? And it'll be from Lockheed Martin. It'll be from Boeing. It'll be from Dyncor. And you say, what is this? It's because they're not trying to sell us anything. The audience of those ads that cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars every year is an audience of about 50. It's the members and staff of two congressional committees, the Armed Services Committee and the Appropriations Committee, the ones who decide which contracts they're going to get, who's going to get to build the new planes and the new submarines and the new bombs. That's what those ads are named at. They, they don't care if we see them or like them or hate them or love them. Doesn't matter. We're not the audience. We're not going to go out and buy an aircraft carrier. This is aimed at the people who are, right? And they are making a killing. Uh, my colleague Sarah Anderson, who every year does a great expose on CEO pay and what it looks like every year. And every year she has a different theme. A few years ago her theme was the warmongers. The, the, the CEOs of the, of the war industries and what are they doing. And what she found was that after 9-11, the CEOs of most countries were making a, pay, a, a huge, huge, huge salary, but their payments were going up about 7%. In the war industries, they went up 200%. And one of our favorites, who luckily went to jail for a brief moment, a guy named David Brooks, the CEO of a company called DHB Industries that made body armor for US troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. Between 2001 and 2004, he ended up with a 13,349% raise in his salary. And guess what? His vests didn't work. His vests were the reason that so many parents of young soldiers were mailing through FedEx uh, bulletproof vests that they bought online at Amazon because they worked and the ones that this clown was making didn't work. That's what our support for war looks like. And then we talk about what happens when the wars come home. So we know that the cost of war at home is monumental. It's monumental in money, it's monumental in blood, it's monumental in the destruction of people's minds, it's monumental in the destruction of whole generations who are brought up somehow to treasure and cherish war as what makes them great, as what makes our country great. But the direct costs are extraordinarily high. I'll get to that in a minute. But the other part of it that we don't always think about in the context of the cost of war is what happens to communities in this country whose people happen to have the bad luck to look like the people who are under the bombs and at the other end of our foreign policy. So why do we have right now such a rise in Islamophobia in the United States? Why do we have the Muslim ban? Islamophobia is not a new it's not a new concept in the US. It has an old and sordid history. It's been around a long time. But why is it on the rise the way it is? It's because without Islamophobia, how do you convince ordinary young people in this country to be willing to go to war against people who they've never met, have never heard of, can't find their country on a map, and have never done anything to them unless you can convince them that these are all people who are evil? that they are all collectively responsible for something that 19 people who happen to be Muslims did 15 years ago. So you need to build Islamophobia. And if we look at the history of the recent period of Islamophobia, not the early history that goes back 200 years, but the current recent history, it didn't start with 9-11. It started with the Iranian Revolution in 1978. When looking around the room, I'm seeing most of you remember T-shirts that had Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini's face with, a, with a crosshairs on it. And what did that 
What did that do? It meant that that was a target. That was what made it okay to hate Muslims. And then we saw the same thing with Saddam Hussein. Ironically enough, the, the most secular of all these dictators who suppressed, as was true in, in, in uh, Syria as well, really suppressed any, any Islamist forces. But that didn't matter. By getting people to hate Muslims, they can get them to go to war against Muslims. And when the countries you're trying to go to war with, they're not going to war. Let's be clear. The US is not going to war against Iran and Iraq and Syria and Libya because they're Muslims. They're going to war with Muslims because Muslims happen to be the majority in the countries they want to go to war against. And as we all know, if their main export was broccoli, there would not be any bombing going on. It's because of oil. It's because of military bases. It's because of the expansion of power. It's because of geography. This is like buying real estate, right? It's about location, location, location. If you control the Middle East, you can send bombers, you can send troops against three quarters of the world, against Europe, against Asia, against Africa. They're all right there. They're all right there. So that's what we are looking at. And when you have a cabinet made up of generals and gazillionaires, you've got a big problem of hammer and nails. If you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you're a general, every problem requires a military solution. And you might differ on what kind of military. Should we send troops? Oh, no. Well, let's just send the bombers. Oh, no. Let's send the drones. And then, the yeah, you can differ on that. But what is not up for question is whether a military response is required. That's what we're, that's what we're looking at. So when you have Rex Tillerson suddenly in charge of the State Department instead of being in charge of ExxonMobil, does it really matter very much which one he's doing at any given moment? When you have Mad Dog Mattis as the Secretary of Defense, and we're told he's the intellectual, the military intellectual. Well, that may well be. But you know, there's an old saying that military music is to music what military justice is to justice. Or I guess it should be said the other way around. But you get my point. And the same thing is true for military intellectuals. They are generals first and intellectuals second. He can be a really smart guy. I have no reason to think he's not. But his starting point is, what do we do? We send the Marines. We might try and do other stuff first, but at the end of the day, that's what will, that's what will work. So then we get to the question of what are the effects of it at home? Remember I mentioned the cost of the wars? You know, the US military budget this year was almost $600 billion. And on top of that, Trump was proposing raising the military budget by $54 billion more. And that $54 billion was going to come out of the State Department. It was going to come out of the EPA. It was going to strip us of things that actually make us safe, like dealing with climate chaos, like diplomacy triumphing over war. Strip 30% of all those budgets. If you, don't have, if you don't have diplomats, you don't have to worry about diplomacy, right? So, we're talking about a 54% increase. The budget that is now at play in the Congress is not almost $54 billion more. It's almost $100 billion more. It's almost $700 billion this round for this new military budget. And remember that that's 54 cents out of every discretionary dollar in the US budget. So when people say, well, we don't have enough money for health care, it's like, yeah, well, there's a reason for that. We don't have enough money for education. We don't have enough money for free college or for infrastructure repair. Yeah, well, there's a reason for that, because 54 cents of every federal dollar is going to the military. And we talk a lot about a billion here and a billion there. And I just want to say one thing. A billion is, it, you might as well say a gazillion, because frankly, none of us have a clue how big a billion is. Let me just tell you a couple examples of what one billion dollars could do. And remember, we're talking here almost $700 billion. $1 billion, you could hire 12,372 elementary school teachers for a year. You could create 17,999 infrastructure jobs. You could put 112,225 children into Head Start. That's what you can do with $1 billion. $30 billion, you can solve the problem of clean water for the entire world. $10 billion, you can stop world hunger. We are putting $700 billion into the military. So what do we do about it? That's what I want to shift to. What do we do about our movements? Five minutes more, and I'm going to do our movements. 
The key question here is that, look around. We have a huge challenge. And we have been saying that in the peace movement for 25 years, that our movement is too old, too white, and in many situations, though thankfully not here, too male. Pale, male, stale. It's the old saying about the peace movement. It's still true, except for the male part. You men that are here, thank you, but you get my point. The problem is we're dealing with it wrong. We're dealing with it from the vantage point of how do we rebuild a, a, a strong, independent peace movement that's more diverse, that has more young people, more people of color. That's the wrong question. That's the wrong question. We had that for the first five years of Bush's war when the war in Iraq was the centerpiece of the entire progressive movement. There's a host of reasons why that was the case. It hasn't been the case since the economic crisis of 2007, since the election of Obama in 2008. We can go into all the reasons we want, and we should. We should understand it. But it doesn't change the fact that that has not been the case for 10 years. So what do we need to do? It's not about rebuilding our movement stronger so we can lead in the street. We ain't going to lead. There are movements that are rising. They are incredible. They are exciting to watch. They are made up of young people, people of color, led by women, led by trans women, queer women. It's an amazing moment for new movements. It's not our movement that is leading. It's the immigrant rights movement, the refugee protection movement. It's Black Lives Matter. It's Standing Rock. Those are the movements that are leading. What do we need to do as a self-defined peace movement? We need to get that information, the stuff we get from the National Priorities Project of what is it costing every single community in this country to go to war in Iraq, in Afghanistan, the global war on terror, et cetera, into the hands of those movements. We need to be working with Black Lives Matter on the question of the militarization of police. Why is it that there was a tank on the streets of Ferguson after Mike Brown was killed? Because the Ferguson police force had decided that they would say yes to the Pentagon when the Pentagon said, hey, you want a tank? We got some left over from Afghanistan. It's like, why do we need a tank in the streets of Ferguson? But we got one, so let's use it, hey. That's what we are dealing with. So that's the kind of movement that we need to be building. Working with the movements that are leading, getting over our sense that we need to lead. That is so last century. <laughs> but we need to be very clear that the resistance that is rising, the resistance against Trump in, in general is a big part of it, but the real resistance that looks like Standing Rock redefining international solidarity, that looks like Black Lives Matter redefining what a policy statement would look like. And when the Black Lives Matter policy platform included a whole section on internationalism and the need for human rights and the United Nations as part of that, that's a sign that our work for so many years has taken root. We need to nurture those roots and grow those flowers. You know, I want to end with two things. One is that something that Dr. King said. This idea that history, when you look at history, that the arc bends towards justice. That's true, but it doesn't do it by itself. That's our job. That's our job, to force the arc to bend towards justice. And the other thing I want to say is from the great historian Howard Zinn. Now, many of you have probably read Howard's great opus, The People's History of the United States, a really crucial book. But there's one thing that Howard wrote that he's written in other ways as well, not only in that book, which I think is crucial for us to remember. And that is when he talks about the origins of this country being rooted in slavery and genocide. Genocide against the native people of this country, slavery that enslaved millions of Africans who were brought to this country in chains and enslaved when they got here. But he also said, from the beginning, we were also another country. We were also the country where movements stood against slavery, against genocide, and later for the environment and against racism and against segregation and for women's rights and for GLBT rights, for all of these things, for the rights of children, for the United Nations, for all of what we stand for. And that's the country that we have to reclaim. Howard Zinn was right. We are the country that was grounded and made powerful and made rich when white people 
took over this country and based it on genocide and slavery. But we are also the country that stood back and built movements against it. So it's that legacy, whether it's protecting refugees and saying if we're really going to protect refugees, that means stopping the wars that cause people to become refugees, whether it's saying we don't want tanks on the streets of our city, whether it's saying enough with supporting Israel's occupation of Palestinian land, all of these things are part of broader movements that we have to help bring to fruition. That's our job. Thank you.